Okay, we have two groups to finish up today and then we need to talk about marketing channels. And then on Thursday, we'll have the third exam. Is that right? Is that Thursday? I think that's what it said. Yep, this her face. Bryce Ward Fortis. I'm Austin Rhodes. I'm Anthony Bohannon. I'm Austin Miller. I'm Aj Rowe. I'm Janet Klein. And I'm Cynthia Miller. And we're talking about five different points of marketing issues that will dominate in 2019. So in 2019, with such a high rise in technology and social media, most companies nowadays are using social media to market their products or services. Roughly 88% of companies use social media to market in one way. They do this is through influencers or people with high influence with the public or the you know, general people to like market their products. 62% of companies use influencers to market their products. This is a good way to market, but there are several problems with this. We talked about five different problems with influencer marketing. We're going to be going through those now. So becoming an influencer in the 21st century is like becoming a uh, Hollywood celebrity. Um, for an example, whenever I was younger, I would watch like action movies, Tom Cruise and Mission Impossible, for example. I would see him holding his breath for like five minutes or punching through glass. And it always made me like, holy crap, I can do that. But I couldn't. So, like, people see influencers and stuff on social media promoting something, and they think to themselves, hey, I can do that, when in reality, they really can't. Um, fake sponsored content has the potential to create risk for companies. An example for that is uh, Nike. There's a website called replica90.com. And it's an off-brand company in China that sells shoes that look just like Nike for like 40 bucks. So a cheap college, college kid like me, I would rather pay $40 for shoes that look like Nike than spend $120 on actual Nikes. So that kind of creates risk for the, the actual Nike company to run out of business because they have people coming up making shoes that look just like theirs. Um, a fake sponsored content play could force brands to more closely monitor uh, media. For example, um, a plague is continental distress, causing continental distress, um, and sponsored content just like a like could spread just like a wildfire. I mean, unless someone stops it, it's just going to keep getting worse and worse. So basically, these uh, influencers and uh, and people that promote the, these products uh, are uh, usually are chosen by these companies since they have uh, a big amount of followers. But sometimes these followers are not like real people that are following; they're just uh, fake accounts that are created in uh, many social media platforms. For example, Facebook has disabled around eighty uh, three. 83 million accounts that were fake, and that makes about 25% of the entire social media page. And there was a huge increase during the year of uh, 2018. So these uh, these follow uh, these influencers uh, have these fake followers. So when the, the company comes and asks them to promote their product, they don't get the, the you know like the response that they were waiting to happen since they had those followers. Like, a, a, not a lot of people are, are following their product, trying their product, so they're like, what is going on? Like, how does how this person have 10 million followers and only like 20 or 30 people that came to our, to our, uh, to our page from that person? And this, and this can uh, cause, the, uh, cause the marketers to have some misleading information. For example, uh, the, uh, the reviews that they have. There are some surveys that you can take and they will give you money for it just to make their product look good. And these uh, are some <coughs> rates in which you can buy followers 
for example, 400 followers, you just have to pay uh, less than two dollars or a thousand to like six six dollars and so on. Um, with the higher use of like influencer marketing, um, a huge problem that can arise is like drama between different agencies because so many different marketing campaigns are using independent marketing agencies to execute their strategies. And so let's say you pay a company and they don't pull through on what they say they do, there's a lot of drama that can arise between that. And like for example, um, one of the biggest influencer marketing agencies, Speaker, they um, they kind of got themselves in economic trouble because they started saying that they would do all these things and then they didn't pay these people back or they paid people back with money they didn't have. So a lot of drama can arise between that. So the most important thing is that like these campaigns need to focus on making good relationships between themselves and these marketing agencies because you don't want to go pay somebody and then they don't want to pull through on the work they said they're going to do for you. So. Okay. So I'm going to talk about the continued rise of the influencer entrepreneur. So um, a lot of influencers are starting their own businesses, and this is creating an issue for marketers because they're having to pick from a smaller platform from influencers that have like less amount of followers. And then um, it's easy for influencers to start their own brands because they turn their followers and subscribers into consumers, already giving them such an easy platform. Also, um, influencers are starting to protect their brands, such um, once they start their own um, business, like in the fire festival, like that caused a big problem for influencers. So they just don't want to associate with other brands that could tarnish their own brand. And then one of the examples that um, I was able to find was um, Huda Katan. She's a, started her own beauty company from Dubai. And in a, few, in a couple of years, she has an empire of $550 million. So for ROIs, what an ROI is is a return on investment and it measures the performance and evaluates how efficient an investment will be, or it compares the efficiency number of different investments. And uh, ROIs tend to try and directly analyze the amount of return on certain investments close to the price range. And it's very popular today with business because it's simple and versatile. And so like to calculate your ROI, you would take your cost of investment and then divide it by uh, your return on investment and then divide it by the cost of investment. But for digital marketing, how you find the ROI on that is you would take your sales growth on whatever product line that you have and you subtract it by your cost of marketing and divide it by your cost of marketing. And the problem is that companies now, they don't tend to uh, utilize this and use it. And so in the long run, it creates problems for their company financially. And so, and it's because a lot of the reason is they tend to focus on the social media aspect and they try and get a lot of their base from social media. So, like I said, most companies use social media and it's influencer marketing. And as we talked about all the different problems with it, we hope we can stay in the and explain to you guys the different problems with this type of marketing. Do you guys have any questions? No questions. Gosh, you guys are <clears throat> not awake in the mornings, apparently. Wait till you turn 40 and you start getting up at 5 a.m. So there are two types of fraud that the law recognizes. One is called fraud in the inducement. And then there's something called fraud in the factum. So fraud in the inducement is where you basically sell something that you don't necessarily have fraud in the factum is where you say that you have the product, but you say it will do something that it won't do. Are these types of social influencers susceptible to that kind of legal charge? I mean, yeah, I would still say they are. I, and then to go for that, just for example, I know it's not really online, but I know I, my aunt was buying a car and they did that to her and she bought it I was supposed to pick it up on like a Saturday or something they sold out from underneath her and they ended up getting like they, and she's a lawyer so she knew like the rule of that and wanted to be company and yeah they don't work there anymore but it definitely happened <coughs> nowadays. There are also people you know that pretend like they're you know I guess in 
influencers are like marketing for some certain <coughs> brand mm -hmm. and they like you know market that brand but they're not actually working for that company you know to market it so i guess they're kind of doing it illegally you know yeah where do you draw the line between a com company representative and you know <clears throat> somebody who's just out there you know putting their own content out it's easy to do it's hard to regulate in an era of the World Wide Web because it's hard to stop somebody in another country. And these traditional legal terms that we use to protect consumers are difficult to do in an online environment because uh, they could be somewhere else. They could be in Russia, you know, and talking about shipping you medications. How do you how do you how do you verify that these people are legitimate? It's difficult. I mean, there's really no way. I mean, it's, it's, it's very hard. Yep. All right. Any other questions? Very good. It was probably mine oh, on channels sorry. marketing. That's okay. I think I can find it, hopefully. Is it okay for live Um, it's okay. It probably won't let you log in. Because these computers are locked down so that students can't log into them. I mean, you can try it. Oh, it actually came up. Okay. Top right. Uh, we're doing the controversy of target marketing. I'm James Horn. I'm Tucker Dyson. So target marketing is an effective way to market to, uh, to your ideal customer, audience uh, seamlessly integrated so that they may not realize that they're being targeted. And we're going to be talking about is it ethical to market, market dangerous or unhealthy products? First off is casinos and gambling. Uh, they appeal to customers by promising free stuff. Like, uh, you go in and they'll say, you spend $50, they'll give you a free $20 play pass, but it's really not free because you already just spent $50. So they're basically just giving you a little bit of money back just to spend back at the casino. Uh, bright lights, uh, sounds, no cell service, no clocks, no windows, and tinted doors create a distraction-free environment. Uh, regardless of like what you win, the machine will always flash with multiple colors and play sounds that will encourage risky decision-making. So, like, I mean, regardless if you win five cents or $500, it's still going to flash the same lights, the same sounds. I mean, unless you hit the jackpot, of course, it's going to flash for multiple minutes. Uh, casinos make uh, sure you stay longer than you want it. Um, you know, also, like, they play slot machines by the front door, so whenever you're done, you're, you're walking past that slot machine, and it starts making noises and basically calling your name. And uh, they just want you to play one more time, but that never happens. Um, they bring in large and diverse audience. Uh, so the addition to the child care, they have a child care service at Treasure Island Resort and Casino. And 
as young as six months old can go there and as old as 12. They have iPad stations, arts and crafts, uh, toddler, toddler rooms, and basically the parent just pays hourly to the child care service and they just have a stress-free environment to go gamble while their child is being taken care of. So I'm going to talk about cigarettes and tobacco. And big tobacco companies use extreme target marketing strategies to target higher risk demographics. And in studies, it says that people with low income are more likely to smoke. And other studies prove that in black neighborhoods, or predominantly black neighborhoods, uh, tobacco marketing increases by 70%. And, and it's like this in all um, low income places. And they run, tobacco companies will run more sales that'll make their product more easily to buy for people that they know or that studies have shown to buy their product. And in the 60s, tobacco executives bought Kool-Aid, Hawaiian Punch, and they used the same marketing strategies. And so with this, the, um, I think all of us are still in the generation. We know who like the, the Kool-Aid man or the Kool-Aid guy is who breaks down walls and everything. And so this was released in the, set, in the early 70s. So the marketing strategies that they used then are still applying to us today. And in the Truth Tobacco, tobacco documents, a tobacco executive said that their primary, primary goal in buying um, Kool-Aid and Hawaiian Punch was to reach kids so they could use the same strategies. And then whenever they became adults, those same strategies would work on them easier to buy cigarettes and tobacco. And then they used um, the same flavors like apple and candy flavors in their chewing tobacco and cigarettes to make it easier for first-time people to use them. And Hawaiian Punch was actually a mixer drink whenever they bought it, and they kept the formula the same. They just marketed differently and marketed it to kids instead. And every year, uh, Big Tobacco spends $8.7 billion a year, or $23 million a day in marketing. And to me, this is a big problem because we know that tobacco kills people, and they're still willing to spend $23 million every single day marketing to people. So the next thing we're going to talk about is unhealthy um, so, you know, lots of commercials for like McDonald's and Arby's and Burger King, but we never really see the commercials for like healthy food, like you never see a commercial for a salad or anything like that. Um, and in these commercials, the unhealthy food is being portrayed as harmless, like it can't do anything to you, like it's not unhealthy and that looks really appealing. Um, but this could be the link as to why 10% of US children are obese, and I think it's even higher than that now. Um, but yeah, so these ads are targeting children who have great influence over their family's buying decisions. So if the kids see this on TV or even on social media, they're going to want it and tell their parents, and then that'll influence what they eat um, and their overall health. But in the UK, and I think something that we could probably implement here, is they have really strict policies about um, the ads that target children. So if you're marketing an ad, you're not allowed to market it to children. So we're going to take a look at social media in relation to target marketing in a book entitled Social Media Marketing and Utilizing Consumer Generated Content by Amy Norici. It basically talks about how the introduction of the internet has revolutionized access to information and how this has essentially shifted brand power from the manufacturer or the supplier towards the consumer through social media. So this has led to um, such things such as ghost accounts, where people create falsified accounts to generate influence. And another controversial um, way that social media has influenced um, target marketing is when we look at Donald Trump's campaign and how almost 15 million Facebook profiles were harvested by the company that worked for him. And this just shows how Influence can be generated through um, social media to create influence towards polarizing and favoring Donald Trump. Another thing that has come about due to social media is social media influencers. These are people that have access to large amounts of um, audiences and that can persuade people of virtue of their authenticity and reach. 
for example, if we look at the jewel, the East uh, cigarette, they use a social media influencer called Christina Zaya, who was 36, but essentially jewels and um, e-cigarettes are targeted towards um, younger audiences. This is one example of how detrimental social media and influencing play when it comes to targeting our consumers. So for our recommendations, I would recommend policies that protect vulnerable groups, so children and unhealthy food and low-income groups and tobacco and gambling. Um, and then just to be an informed consumer, so know that a lot of the ads you see are targeted for you, um, and just to know that they affect you even when you don't really realize it. You all have any questions? Yes. Uh, okay, Sarah, you, you had said um, in the UK, um, they, they have put laws to protect kids from uh, commercial death, cause of obesity and all that. But my question is, how can you separate that? You know, like, if you bought a commercial on TV, how do you try to separate it in a way that it only it could only be tar uh, targeted towards um, adults and not kids? Mm -hmm. um, so it didn't really say a lot about that. It just said that it was really heavily regulated. So I think just like not directly targeting at kids. Something I read about was um, companies that would make like games that kids could play like on an app on their phone, but it was sponsored by like McDonald's. So just not doing things like that. So I know you can't really control like what they do see, but they are putting precautions in place to at least regulate. Can't put toys in Happy Meals. That's, they, that's I mean, that's the law. They can't, that's one of the ways they argue is, you know, they, they advertise in the United States, they put, Whatever the latest Disney movie or whatever it is, that's, that's the toy that's in the Happy Meal, and they market it. You can't do that. In, in also, most like of regardless of like what YouTube video you watch, the same ads are gonna play, regardless if it's like a tutorial video or like uh, Barney, you know, like old Barney episodes. Like it's still gonna play the same exact ads as all YouTube. So you you talked about unhealthy foods. What's an unhealthy food? I mean, most of what I read about was fast food, so just like ultra processed foods that are really high in fat and stuff that's really high in sugar. So in the 1950s, the U.S. Uh, DA, uh, FDA, put out health guidelines for what was a healthy breakfast. They said a healthy breakfast was two eggs, dry toast, and coffee. By the 1980s, they said eggs were more dangerous than bullets because of the cholesterol. Dry toast was nothing but sponge sugar and coffee. Uh, with caffeine uh, led to heart disease. By 2015, they had reversed that, and they said that most of the cholesterol that you eat has nothing to do with your cholesterol in your body. That's largely genetic. 50% of the cholesterol that you have that's measured is in your brain. It's actually hypothesized that cholesterol prevents you from getting Alzheimer's and that cholesterol-taking drugs may lead to Alzheimer's. So now we've gone back to two eggs, Dry toast and coffee is the ideal practice. <laughs> All right, good job. So we need to talk about channels marketing. And I will be honest with you, this is my least favorite part of marketing. It's one of the oldest subfields of marketing. And when I went to get my PhD, I went down to OU, and they said, well, we'll admit you because John Cady, who was our associate dean at the time, had given me a good recommendation, but they said um, that uh, they hoped I was interested in logistics and I and, and channels, and I was like, mm, not really. I mean, just not my not my thing because it's just kind of boring. But it's sort of natural that we would have a logistics school in Oklahoma because where are we in Oklahoma? We're right smack dab in the middle of the country, so it's easy to do what? Get lots of data from shipping companies. So it's, it's kind of a natural fit, because we sit at the crossroads of three major interstate systems here in Oklahoma, I-40, I-35, and I-44. And so there's a lot of stuff that goes through here. The Port of Catoosa 
is the farthest most northern and western port in the United States for, uh, transportation port, shipping port, in terms of water um, until you get to the west coast. And so it's an important part of our economy. Things that you don't even think about are shipped in and out of Oklahoma. So for example, my boat used to be at the port of Muskogee, which is one port away from the port of Catoosa. And at the port of Muskogee, they would bring in every month 35 uh, barges, huge barges with sand from Saudi Arabia because Dockle Tile was manufactured in Muskogee. So that's all transportation and logistics. You wouldn't think about that. Sand from Saudi Arabia coming into Oklahoma, but it does. It transfers, it comes on, on water, and we manufacture a lot of tile as a result of that. So this is the E, this is the fourth key of the place uh, part of the marketing mix. And the analogy is to a pipeline through which liquid flows, right? That's what we want. So the channels are like this pipeline through which goods and services flow to consumers. It's one of the oldest fields of marketing. Some of the earliest marketing studies were logistic studies. They were done, so some of the oldest departments of marketing actually started at agricultural and mechanical schools where they were concerned with getting product to market in the most efficient way because a lot of things are perishable. So for example, the University of Wisconsin was a big early marketing uh, department. What they manufacture a lot of in Wisconsin? Cheese. And what is cheese? Well, it's perishable after a while, although maybe not, because what is blue cheese? It's basically moldy cheese. Right? I mean, so, but it's, it's, at some point, it's not going to be good to eat. So how do we get that from the consumer in Wisconsin to all over the United States in the most efficient way? Um, it's often the part that's not thought of by the consumer, and the consumer is actually generally uh, skeptical of it. You hear ads all the time, cut out the middleman, you know, buy direct. And that sounds good, but channels actually do provide value. So a modern study, one that I did read when I was in, in the PhD program, was 90% of everything by Rose George. She's not actually a marketer. She's a journalist, but she did what would be considered one of these sort of classic studies. The cheese studies, for example, I think they actually got onto railroad cars and just followed the trains to see which were the most efficient routes to get product from uh, the way through uh, the uh, Suez Canal and down through uh, past the, the, the east coast of Africa through pirate territory where the Somali pirates are hijacking ships and, and ends up and, and writes about this experience about how goods are shipped. Most people don't, don't think about it. She starts out the book by asking people how much, and she lives in Great Britain. She lives on an island nation, so you would think they would think that maybe more goods were shipped to them because they're what? An island, and lots of things are shipped. So she asked people you know, on the subway before she starts this journey, what percentage of your goods do you think are brought to you on a ship? And most people answered like 10%, 15%. I think the highest answer she got was 20%. These are people who live, again, on an island. Think about this. Lots of it's going to have to be shipped. 90% of everything arrives by ship. Now, Apple doesn't actually ship their iPhones from China um, by container ship because they're more they're more uh, concerned with just-in-time inventory control, and so they actually bring them over on C-130s. But the other uh, the other manufacturers of phones generally do ship their cell phones on container ships. What would you think it costs? This is how efficient shipping has become. What do you think it costs to ship a device that's about this size on a container ship from China to the United States? What part of the price that you pay? Because eventually you're paying for this, right? You're paying for the transportation logistics. What do you think it costs? Probably uh, one, one thousand. One thousand. Paying a very small amount. Oh, wow. You're really, really low. It's more than that. It's more than, it's more than one thousand. Dollars? It's less than a couple dollars. No. Less than a dollar. It's about five cents. So it's about five cents to ship this. So that's how efficient it is. And that's where channels add value. We manufacture this stuff. It's manufactured by Apple and other companies in China. Why? Because cheaper labor, but you can ship it over here. I mean, if the, if the shipping costs were exorbitant, if it costs $5 to ship this over here, 
you would start seeing these being manufactured in the United States. Because at that point, it would probably be worth it. But that's what shipping does. It has value. It allows us to manufacture this in using cheap labor someplace else and bring it over to the United States in an efficient way. So, types of intermediaries. Middleman, that's any intermediary between the producer and the end user. So, that can be retailers, wholesalers, um, distributors, dealers, agents, brokers, things like that. These terms are oftentimes imprecise. Agent or broker. This is an intermediary with legal authority to act on behalf of a manufacturer. Now, the most common agent that we think of in our daily lives is probably a real estate agent or an insurance agent. That's the one that you think of most, right? Real estate agents don't take title to the property. When you list your house for sale, they're not taking title to it. They're just acting as a facilitator of the transaction to make it more smooth. How do they do that? Well, in theory, real estate agents know something that maybe you don't about marketing, particularly in real estate. How to get your house on the multiple listing. Now, this is not as big a deal as it used to be because you can put your house on the MLS. My mother owned a real estate company in the 1980s. This was a big deal because only realtors had access to the MLS. And there were these books that came out weekly, these thick books that had all of the listings in a city or an area. And realtors were not supposed to give them out. So you'd have to go to the realtor to find out whether homes were, you know, unless you wanted to just drive around, which a lot of people did. A lot of people would just drive around the neighborhoods that they wanted to buy in, and they would look at houses and, and see if there was a for sale sign, and then they would contact the realtor. So what else? Now you can put your house on the MLS really easily. There's lots of companies that will help you do that, so you don't necessarily need a realtor. But what, what else do they do that helps facilitate the transaction? Well, it's not just the MLS. There are other ways of marketing your homes now. If you want to get it on what? Zillow, Realtor.com, and those will all... You can get it on those. You can get your house on Zillow and Realtor without paying the Realtor. Anything that goes on the MLS will get on Zillow or Realtor because they aggregate those. But if you want to get premium placement in that, then the Realtors know how to do that. They also know what kinds of, in, in America, under the statute of frauds, transactions and real property have to be in writing. And so you want to make sure that that writing is sufficient. So Realtors add that kind of value. The same thing goes in consumer goods. There are agents who bring buyers and sellers together, and they don't take actual title to the product. Coffee brokers, um, things like that. Wholesalers are intermediaries who sell to other intermediaries. Usually, they sell to retailers. That's what they usually do. A retailer is the intermediary that sells directly to consumers. A distributor is an imprecise term. A lot of these are actually very imprecise. Uh, an intermediary who performs one or more of the distribution functions. So the company that I work for, the American Education Corporation, we actually sold through a distributor distribution network. So we would sell our product to people that were distributors that sold LMSs to schools and prisons and other institutions. So we did that because we didn't want to pay all these inside salespeople it was cheaper for us to outsource that function to them, and then they provided car dealers. Car dealers, right? Think about car dealers. What did you say? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. So I actually wanted to do a when I first um, got my PhD, I wanted to do a study in uh, the drug trade, the illicit drug trade. My department chair said no, not until you get tenure because you know that's dangerous. But there are like all of these. You know, basically the drug trade has the same kind of organization that large businesses do. And there are statutes that deal with this. The Racketeering Influence and Corrupt Organizations Act deals with this. And they call the CEO of, of a drug trade organization the kingpin, right? So that's what they, they don't call him CEO. They call him the kingpin. That's the title, I think, of the Rico. Uh, and this is the this is the guy, you know, in Colombia or uh, Mexico that's the head of the organization. So they have similar, you know, functions in, in the non-illicit trade. So value that's created by intermediaries. They create transactional value. So for example, they buy stuff, products for resale. When I don't really like candy for the most part, but if, I, if I'm gonna eat any kind of candy, it's Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. Those are my favorite. I'm not a big sweets person. My brother and my dad, 
have got like, and I don't know how they're not larger than I. They're both thin, and they both eat. They just must have the metabolism, uh, you know, of a god because they're both thin and they eat nothing but chocolate, candy bars, and stuff like that constantly. I don't like chocolate and candy bar. I'd much rather have steak and a baked potato any, any day of the week. But if I'm going to eat candy, and a, a couple times a year that I do eat it, I like Reese's peanut butter cups. And I think that sort of makes sense because Reese's peanut butter cups are not really all that sweet. They're more savory. The peanut butter is salty, and it's not it's not like a overly sweet candy bar that's just you know hopped up on sugar. And so I love Reese's peanut butter cups twice a year when I eat them. But I don't want like a pallet of Reese's peanut butter cups, do I? I want what? One or two. Like one package of Reese's peanut butter cups. I don't want an entire pallet. So they buy these, these products from the manufacturers who want to sell them in pallets for Reese's peanut butter cups. And I don't want to buy that. So they're buying it and they're taking possession of it and that adds value to me because I don't have to go to I can't remember who made the So I don't want to go to Hershey, Pennsylvania. I got lucky there. I don't want to go to Hershey, Pennsylvania to buy a my the two times a year that I eat Reese's, which are generally Halloween and they're coming up on the second biggest day of chocolate buying in the United States, which is what? Easter. Easter. And Easter is the biggest chocolate buying day worldwide, by the way. And so I don't want to go to Hershey's, Pennsylvania. So they're buying it and keeping it and, and storing it so that I don't have to go all the way to Hershey's, Pennsylvania to do it. And it Tornado, wipe out their 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 pallets of, of Reese's peanut butter. They provide logistical functions, sorting, creating product assortments. So wholesalers and distributors will break down the pallets and they'll ship out cases to retailers of so not just Reese's peanut butter cups, but also what? What are some of the other more disgusting ones that people like? Milk duds. Milk duds. <laughs> that sounds like more horrible to me. Yeah. M and M's, paydays, watch McCallins. Product assortments. Um, assembling products and putting them to convenient locations, and then transporting them, making sure that they get where they need to get in time. They also provide facilitating functions in many instances. They provide financing. So my business that we have in Guthrie, we can we buy stuff from US Foods for our restaurant. And if we wanted to, we don't, we're a cash business, but if we wanted to, they do extend credit. They could do 30 days, um, not same as cash to us. We don't, because we're small and we can just write the check every week when they come and deliver the stuff but they do extend credit. And for bigger restaurants, that's a big deal, right? Being able to buy that. They oftentimes rely on, on that to, to, to carry them through. Grading, inspecting, testing, and assessing quality. Meat distributors, packers, um, are involved in this. There are different types and grades. So I was born and raised on a cattle farm. That's probably one of the reasons I like steak. We had a lot of it growing up, it was a really good steak. My, uh, my father early on focused on uh, producing organically grown before that was even a big movement, but you know, non-hormone injected, no antibiotics, range-free cattle. And if you eat that, by the way, the chances of getting things like E. coli are less because there's, there's less um, E. coli in the, in the animal's gut than those that are, that are corn fed. And so, with regard to beef, there are different grades of beef. There's prime, which you can only get in selective areas. Then there's USDA choice, and, and there are various grades within there. So that's one of the facility, that's one of the functions, facilitating functions that some intermediaries. Now, not all intermediaries provide all of these functions or value, but they provide some of them, or at least uh, one or more of them. And then ultimately having the products when, where, and how the customer wants them. So having that Reese's peanut butter cup or having the steak, I don't want to buy at this point in my life an entire, and people used to do this. They used to rent locker space when it was harder to get beef. 
uh, on a daily basis or it was more variable, people would actually go buy a cow or they'd go in with somebody else. This was very common, particularly in states like Oklahoma, where people would actually go in together and they'd buy like a, a whole cow, they would have it slaughtered, and then they would rent locker space at some place that would, would keep the cow frozen. He's uh, facilitating um, and other functions that consumers that, that logistics and middlemen create. So, structure and organization of your channel. What you want for consumer products and services, you can have a direct channel. And I see that I retyped that. And I said Schwann's. Um, I flipped the S and the C there, and I changed it. Apparently, it changed it back. So I thought I uploaded it back to you as well. So the Schwann's is correct. They manufacture this stuff, they package it, and they come out. How many of you have bought from Schwann's? You've seen the Schwann's trucks in your neighborhood. They actually have pretty good, pretty decent food. And uh, it's more expensive than going to the grocery store. Why? Because it's delivering to you. Because it's delivering to you. But that's not necessarily true anymore. A lot of these companies that are shipping directly to you, like HelloFresh, Blue Apron, are competing with grocery store prices. And you're still getting the convenience. That's how that's how efficient logistics is becoming. Or you can have indirect channels where you have, for example, a producer to a retailer to consumer. That would be the, the least amount uh, in, an, in an indirect that you could have, producer, retailer, consumer. Usually you have producer, wholesaler, retailer, consumer. Although you can have producer, agent, wholesaler, retailer, consumer. Now, in order to have this, you've got to have these people adding value somewhere along the chain, otherwise they would be eliminated. And that has become one of the things that has been a big topic in this area is something called disintermediation of the channel. So a, a tendency to go direct to consumer. Um, by the day, by the yeah, I'm just saying, kept telling Kuwait. Now, if you look at Kuwait, it looks like it should be part of what? Get on a map and tell me what it looks like it should be a part of. Uh, it looks like it should be a part of Iraq. How did Kuwait come into existence? Well, the British just decided they wanted those oil fields. And so they drew lines. They did this all over the, the African continent, by the way. The British and the French. I mean, they just, just drew arbitrary lines. And they just decided they wanted the oil fields, BP. And so they drew these lines. If you look at it, Kuwait looks like it should be part of Iraq. And Kuwait kept busting their quota. And Saddam Hussein was in a, a death war with Iran and he needed the money to finance that war. And so he kept saying, don't do that. And he would roll his troops up to the border and Kuwait would ease back on their production quota. And he pulled back and they, and they did this like three or four times. And finally in the fifth time, he just went in. Which by the way, our ambassador at the time told him that that would be perfectly fine, we didn't care. And then George Herbert Walker Bush decided to do something else. <laughs> And then he said, we we're fighting for democracy. And we all looked at the map and realized there was no democracy there. And then it was, we're fighting for freedom. Iraq is not a freedom. Kuwait is not a freedom. Uh, the reason I tell you this is that OPEC is not a terribly good cartel. The most successful cartel probably in the history of the world has been in the diamond business. And De Beers is, I mean, they have them on the market. De Beers goes in and says, you will sell them to us, or we will flood the market. De Beers has now finally actually dropped low enough in terms of the amount of uh, tax. The De Beers family, they're a Jewish family. They live in, in um, they're called the Oppenheimers. Their last name is Oppenheimer. They live in the United Kingdom, and they're the one family that the United Kingdom has not allowed us to serve their family members with antitrust papers because they have given the royal family all of their jewels. And by the way, De Beers is the one who decided it used to be historically that you didn't give your fiancé, that's Oklahoman for fiancé, a diamond as an engagement ring. You gave them their birthstone as an engagement ring. And De Beers is the one who came up with the idea that a diamond was forever and a diamond was the only acceptable uh, stone to give your insignificant other. And by the way, it can't be one that's passed down. According to De Beers, it has to be a new diamond for a new relationship. And they're the ones who also came up with a formula for what you should spend on that diamond, which is what? Three months salary. That's what you're supposed to spend. So you all run right out and get married right now while you're poor. You know, because when you become a salesperson and you're making 
I don't know who actually kept diamonds and then shipped them out. Um, and you could lose your site. Or if they got mad at you, they would just give you really crappy diamonds. And they, they chose what you would get. Um, you didn't get to you didn't get to go in and say I want this and this and this. The beers would just bring in a a package to each site. I had to go to London. They would bring in a package and they'd say, and there are. I watched a whole documentary on this. This guy is like, and and he's a fellow Jew, and he's like cussing. He's a Hasidic, and he's like cussing at these you know people in the beers because they they just decided that they got mad at him and they gave him really crappy crappy diamonds that time. So. They've actually become fully integrated. So these, obviously, what you want is you want to lean this out, but we're seeing some re-intermediation of the channel uh, partners. So why is this? Well, for example, Dell was a direct consumer company that had totally disintermediated their product. In order to get a Dell, you couldn't go to Best Buy, you couldn't go to Sam's and get a Dell. You had to go online or you had to call Dell and they would ship you the product. And they did this really efficiently. They cut out all the middlemen, so it meant that the Dells were less expensive. But what happened that led to the reintermediation of products like Dell? Well, what's really important with regard to laptops, it worked really pretty well when it was all desktops, because desktops are not that big of a deal. They were all pretty much the same size, they're heavy, you're not, you're not lugging them around and, and taking them. What does your average laptop weigh now? A couple pounds. Right? I mean, they're not very heavy. They're also got bigger screens than that first laptop that I have. So one of the things that became important with regard to laptop computing is not I've got fat, chunky fingers, and there's a point at which if the, if the, if the keyboard gets too small, I can't use it efficiently. And so you have to test it out. And so there has been some re-intermediation. So you can now buy Dell's where you can buy them at Best Buy, you can buy them at Sam's. Although what a lot of people do is rather than buying them, they go test them out there, they pick them up, they hold them, and then they go online and buy them. You know? But there has been some re-intermediation. In the business to business, you can have direct. So IBM sells direct, for example, to commercial users, or you can have indirect where you have the producer selling to an industrial distributor and then an industrial user. So uh, for example, we buy all of our stuff. This is, I think this is a Dell, isn't it? Yep, it's a Dell. We actually don't buy these directly from Dell. These are a state contract, and so there's an intermediary on that. But um, so we have a, a a contract with a state um, supplier that that uh, provides us with our computers, and we can go through and check and see what we want. You can go producer to agent to industrial user. This is a uh, very typical where you have agents, for example, coffee brokers and things like that that bring people together in a market. And then sell to industrial users like Starbucks. Producer, agent, industrial distributor, user. Um, direct channels, things like Dell. I also use Charles Tierwitz shirts. This is something I never thought would happen, but as, in, as the age of the internet, as some of you have talked about today, I never would have thought that I would buy clothing online. That was the one thing I thought I would always have to try it on. But there's a manufacturer of, I mostly wear French cuff shirts when I wear button down shirts. And there's a manufacturer of those shirts called Charles Tierwitt. They're a, a London company. They're not located in the United States. But I know how they fit. I know how the shirt fits. And so I know how to order from them. And I order directly from the manufacturer. Multi-channel marketing, things like Eddie Bauer. So Eddie Bauer has their own retail store catalog and they also sell to other uh, to other uh, organizations and then you can have dual distribution um, to beers is an example of this as well so they vertically integrated but they still have uh, sites that they sell to and those sites then sell to retailers worldwide most people cannot buy to this day most retailers can't buy directly from the beers they have to buy from a site order to get their done. Manufacturers uh, clothes for men and women, and they are vertically integrated. They sell through their stores um, that they own. Um, and then you can have contractual. So things, this is common in the grocery industry, things like the International Grocers Association, IGA. You don't see a lot of these in towns like in Oklahoma City anymore. They used to be very, very prevalent. There was an IGA that was down on 
15th Street, for example, that's gone out of business because of Walmart and Super Target, but you still see these in smaller towns. So what these contractual systems do is they take advantage of the buying power. Those are IGA, International Grocers Associations, that rely on the contractual system to bring efficiency to their, to their uh, logistical functions. So the factors that you have to consider when you are thinking about the choice of channels in business. What is the best coverage? Do you have an intensive distribution strategy, an exclusive, or a selective? What's intensive? Well, things like Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. Where can you buy Reese's Peanut Butter Cups? Anywhere. Do you buy them anywhere? At any gas station, right? You can go over to the student union and buy a Reese's Peanut Butter Cup. You can buy them in Walmart. You can buy them in Target. You can buy them in lots of stores that sell lots of stuff. And so that's an intensive. Where can you buy a Rolex? If you want to buy a Rolex in Oklahoma City, now I did notice the other day when I was saying they have a Rolex and I don't know how they got it. Rolex is really, really, really bitter about this. Um, but if you want to buy a Rolex with a warranty, DC Clark. there's only one place in Oklahoma City that you can buy it, and it's what? DC Clark. DC Clark. There used to be that you could buy it in Oklahoma City, and the second place lost their Rolex dealership because they were located right across the street. So DC Clark has four locations in Oklahoma City. And then they, one of those locations is located in Penn Square Mall, and right across the street was Gordon, Samuel Gordon Jewelers. And Samuel Gordon Jewelers had a Rolex dealership, and they kept discounting their prices so that they could undercut B.C. Clark and get people to walk across uh, Pennsylvania Avenue, which is dangerous, by the way, it's a dangerous <laughs> street, to go over. And, buy, and Rolex just pulled their dealership and said, we, Rolex does not discount. We do not discount. I mean, Rolex does not want that. So it's an exclusive. There's one place you can buy them in Oklahoma City now, and it's BC Clark. Or are you more selective? Um, things that are shopping goods are generally used more selective. So you can buy them in more places, but not, not everywhere. What are the buying requirements? So if you're dealing in the um, B2B market, you're going to have more specs and more technical uh, language that's probably going to be important, and then the profitability. <clears throat> if you have high margins, you may not need to lean the channel as much as if you have consumer packaged goods where the profit margins are, are raised with that. Right? What's the what's the margin or less on average? It's three percent because of shrink and things like that. Any questions about channels? Well, I got finished early. If you feel cheated, you let me know on Thursday after the exam, and I'll just be happy to lecture you on something else. Uh, it's what? It's online. No, it's not online. Uh, but it's in the syllabus. But I think I did have to. Let me just double check. I think I did have to. Move one chapter, didn't I? Okay. And I can move So if you look at the syllabus, I think I had to move new products into this. I'll have to look, but I'm pretty sure I had to move new products. So it'll be new products, managing products and brands, services, pricing, and channels. What's that first one you said again? The first chapter? Marketing entry strategy? New products. New products. Chapter 10. Because I didn't get through that on the second exam. I will tell you that um, with regard to brand management, there are questions from the lecture that are not uh, not in the book. No. 